Thank you all for tuning in. The following is a presentation of Bald Spots Productions. Be sure to like, comment, and share. You know, subscribe, follow, whatever it is you've got to do to kick that algorithm into gear and help us reach more people. Yes, it is I, your humble host, Bill Hatch. The third, coming to you live from the palatial home studios of Bald Spots Productions in the beautiful city of Malden, Missouri. I almost forgot where we were. I kind of stumbled over my words there. <laughs> for Start yet over, another you know? episode of for yet another episode of YWL Online's Anything Can Happen Saturday, as we're making our way through Catherine Slattery's book. Dear God, I have a question. Um, I guess I should watch how I say that because the emphasis should be in the right spot. Um, but uh, uh, <laughs> joining me today from more than acceptable safe social distances are my father, Chaplain Bill Hatch. How you doing, Pop? Doing well. Hello to my fellow Bible Inquisitors. And my dear friend and brother in Christ, Rudy, the disembodied voice of Rudy. Hi, everybody. I love you all. Waka waka with the Lord. <laughs> there you go. It's good to hear that phrase back in our in our broadcast. Yes, it is. We've been on uh, quite the hiatus. We uh, started back up on Tuesday, uh, taking a look at, uh, I guess, another look at uh, at Matthew three or two and three, part of two and part of three, and uh, um, and uh, getting uh, getting rolling. And now we are back. And for uh, for another uh, another attempt at anything can happen Saturday, we are talking about the Bible, so we have a lot of great material to go through. But first, we have time for a Rudy minute. D D D D D D D D D D D. Hi everybody. Sometimes I have a family member that think they that they can't go to God because they're too bad. They do bad things. But remember, Paul. Saul was a pretty tough, bad guy, and God appeared to him. Jesus appeared to him, and he changed it. He changed himself, and he followed God, and he went to jail. He got beat up, and a lot of things happened to him, but he still stuck. I think he got a real hard life, but he still stuck with God, and that was beautiful. So we got to look at God picks us sometimes because we're bad, and uh, so remember. God is here for the for the sick, not the healthy. So I love you all. Remember, love God, because he's beautiful. Waka waka with the Lord. Amen. Amen, indeed. We are uh, we are all sick. Not not one of us is uh, truly healthy, and uh, and we are all in need of God. So uh, good uh, good minute there, Rudy. Thank you. All. So yes, I have somehow misplaced my copy of uh, Miss Slattery's book, and uh, so uh, so I am flying blind, as it were. <laughs> oh, you have Not your coffee really, now. Not really, but you know, I know that <laughs> we're told that confession is good for the soul, but it doesn't have to be to everybody. We could have run through without <laughs> saying that, but now that you've admitted it, yes. Uh, we love you in the Lord nonetheless. Well, ladies yes, and indeed. gentlemen, listeners, boys and girls, whoever's here today, we've started this study on from Catherine Slatery. I like it because the questions are and responses are very simply put. They're not some highfalutin things that that talk about, well, according to Kierkegaard, who based his works on <laughs> and keep going on with that. Uh, they're simple questions because the Bible is a simple book, and yet it is the most complex thing in the world. The Bible, in a nutshell, is God's story in our history. And I say that to, with, with true heart in the sense that God existed before we ever did. He created us. He created the universe. And that's and everything else that anyone might try to throw in there. Uh, and the Bible tells us that story. If we're willing to look at it. Is 
what you know do we know the bible is true by faith yes we do it was written literally over 1300 years give or take a year maybe i should say 2300 years now that i think out loud about that yeah i, I think so uh, yeah over 5300 years because our beginnings are registered in the bible and it's important for us to realize that God breathed inspiration into multiple writers over many different centuries. And it would be hard pressed for any group of people not associated with each other by time to be able to write these things. They didn't have uh, books to reference when they were inspired by God to write these. Uh, they just did not have them. Uh, the There were no complete Bibles until, uh, well, let's see, early, mid-200 AD, 200 years like after, after Jesus, when they started putting the Bible together. I certainly know how to lose my place quickly. Uh, <laughs> so let me just say that we have to recognize that, and we have to have the faith to believe it. But there's no way any of these men would have, and perhaps one lady, my wife and I really like to say, was Hebrews possibly written by a woman? And was Hebrews written by we a like Hebrew. that idea. <laughs> uh, and that's why, yeah, that's why it talks about coffee. Because he brews because a woman wrote it. Uh, she'll, <laughs> my wife will strangle me for that when she hears it. <laughs> but in truth, uh, the Bible does speak God's truth to us, and it is, was all written and inspired by God. And to be able to say mm -hmm. God is throughout these pages is true. If you look at the book of Esther, you won't find a reference to God, but you can certainly see God's dealings throughout that book. But literally, God is throughout it the whole Bible from beginning to end. Now, the Bible is divided up into Old and New Testaments. Mm -hmm. Testament means covenant or agreement. And there is an Old Testament or Old Covenant, and there is a New Covenant. And God has dealt all of the covenant through uh, the people of Israel, and then to all of us as an extension at the time of Jesus' resurrection. Have to really say it that way, too. Uh, the Old Testament points towards the Gospels. The Gospel is truly the center of the Bible, not physically, because the Old Testament has 39 books. The New Testament, including the Gospels, has 27. And there's many, you know, many more stories in the Old Testament than there are in the New. But still, the Old Testament points towards the coming and life of Jesus. And then after uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, we have the Acts of the Apostles, which tells us about the formation of the church. And then we have the Epistles which start at Romans and goes through Jude. And they're all about referencing how the early church interpreted the gospel and how we have examples to be able to follow even today. The book of Revelation, the last one, still references Jesus because it's about his second coming which we look forward to. We'll be celebrating, well, that's a reference point, but I'm gonna do it anyway, Bill. Uh, in <laughs> right. local time now, current time now, it is two weeks before Easter uh, in the year 2024, in case any of you are listening in future archives, uh, being able to watch that. But we look forward to the second coming, even as we will be remembering the first resurrection of Jesus. Not his first coming, that was Christmas. 
but we will be looking for that. So I yeah. hopefully caught myself on that one. <laughs> so what's the difference yep. between these two agreements, the two testaments? God started off with Abraham primarily. There's a lot of stories in Genesis before Abraham, but he started with Abraham setting off a unique religious faith following. There have been religions all over the world since the beginning, well, nearly the beginning. Perhaps I could say it started with Cain, since he's the one who ran off after he, uh, well, sorry, after sense, he killed his brother Abel. In, in a sense, and, Cain is the uh, Cain was the recipient of the first covenant, because God promised uh, that uh, that He would uh, harm anyone who harmed Him. That, you're right. That was an individual promise or punishment. Yeah. I need to make a pause here, folks. So, Bill, that way you can copy, watch it later. Okay. My little red dot says I'm already at 97%. Yeah, all through the earlier broad, all through the earlier broadcast cast, it stayed at zero until after we, after you hung up. No, you're fine. Uh, it's, okay. It, you're at you're you're at ninety nine percent uploaded. So a little 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 bit of a uh, little bit of you know behind the scenes. Uh, uh, yeah, inside mine baseball, says ninety seven. So <laughs> yeah. But you said you could cut that out. So there. Yeah, I can cut. I can cut out anything I want. All right. So back to the covenant and the agreement. God made the covenant or the agreement with Abraham that his descendants would be blessed, and through those descendants, the whole world would be blessed. That's you and me today. Mm -hmm. uh, if the descendants of Abraham would follow the guidelines God gave them. Now, they didn't get those examples right at the time of Abraham. They literally didn't get them until 400 years later, or some 430 years later, when Moses led the people out of bondage in Egypt. And of course, they did not do well with following uh, the, co the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant was pretty nope. simple. God would take care of them and bless them and do everything that they needed if they would worship him and follow the guidelines that he gave mm -hmm. so that they would live properly and not immorally like the nations and other religions of the world. The new covenant is based, it's all about Jesus. Right. And to know that he is God's son who was predicted throughout the Old Testament as coming, and that if we accepted his example of life and accepted the fact that he was crucified dead but rose again on Easter Sunday, that he's God's son and he can be our Lord and Savior, that we would be blessed with eternity in heaven. That was not really... Uh, shall I say, authorized or offered by God in the Old Covenant. And there is a mystery that I cannot explain. One, why does God love us so much that he was doing all this? And two, uh, why he should say we could be blessed enough to get to go to heaven. Because none of us are perfect. We keep messing up, but we keep asking forgiveness, and he is righteous and stays with his part of the covenant. Right. So we have these two agreements. Nope. As now, I said, uh, the, go ahead, the new agreement, the new agreement does not get rid of the old agreement. It works with the old agreement in order to, uh, in order to bring yes, us up does. to the level that God wants us to. So some people try to say, oh, we don't I need agree. the I'm Old Testament anymore because we got the New Testament. That's okay. Which you know, there are is people who say that uh, uh, we don't. Statement. Yeah. Yes, it is. Because uh, um, God didn't suddenly stop caring about all the things he cared about when he gave the, uh, the laws to, uh, to Moses. 
So, right. uh, um, so yeah. So it is but still we'll, important. We have those. But we are covered by. Yes. We are we are covered by the blood of the lamb. And while we are covered by washed, we're not covered. Old Testament sacrifice, we're blood washed. sacrifices were to cover sins. We are washed in the blood, literally, of True. Jesus upon that cross. Uh, by the way, that only happened one time. We do not re-crucify yep. Jesus or his memory. We try to go forward and say absolutely that the love of God extends through that one time sacrifice of Jesus. There are old, other Old Testament laws that are still good ideas, but they are not as strictly enforced. They don't have to be strictly enforced. They're good guidelines. For instance, thou shall not kill. That is a real good guideline. <laughs> no ends us or question marks. That means other people, by the way. Doesn't mean that we can't kill animals for food. That is totally different. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the examples. There were other laws that I covered in, in our other show Tuesday. And that yep. is, you know, the Pharisees would take God's law and would just blow them out of proportion thinking that they could improve on God's laws. No one can. What I'm no. thinking of in particular is that the Jew, or, yeah, the Pharisees, who were one of the two biggest religious groups within Judaism, uh, believed that in tithing. I am all for tithing. If you read through the whole effort and see what it really means. But they mm -hmm. would take a mint plant, okay? They would grow their own mint, and it's a little bush-type plant. And they would take that mint plant, and they would pluck all the leaves off of it, all the mint leaves, and then they would take 10% of those mint leaves and give them as a tithe to the church synagogue or the temple back when it was in existence. Uh, and they would do that. They would take it down to that small of details. The Bible example, which is in the Gospels, it would say that, you know, Pharisee would have 10 mint plants, should just be taking one of those plants and giving it as a tithe. Uh, not counting all the leaves on all 10 of the bushes and then making sure that it was a true tenth and also not a mint leaf more. Those are the kinds of things that were being exaggerated. Yeah. We still have those kinds of, of situations. Yesterday or this last Sunday in church, uh, we have communion every Sunday. There are other people who say, oh, no, that's too much, too often. You should have it once a month or once a quarter or mm -hmm. semi-annually or finally just once a year. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible just says, as often as you take communion, do it in remembrance of me. And that's Paul quoting from Jesus. And so we can see those kinds of arguments, you know. As a military chaplain, I would uh, have regular worship services in chapel as well as out in the field. Out in the field, I didn't have a problem with it. But in chapel, people would say, oh, we didn't do the Lord's Prayer this week. It wasn't a real service. Or we didn't do communion as often or too often. And then it's not a real worship service. Yes, it is because it's any time you're giving, for, talk, you know, worshiping together in word and deed. It's a worship service, wherever two or more are gathered. Uh, but those are the kinds of things that we ourselves still get locked into. But God has made the new covenant based on Jesus, the sacrifice that he did. He sent him because... He knew, God knew, that we weren't able 
to do what he first wanted with Adam and Eve. And it only took, we say an apple, but it only took a piece of fruit to show how easy it was for people to sin and how scheming the devil can be. So we have that for certain. The Bible, Old Testament, tells us about the love of God for everyone. It's extended into the New Testament. For instance, in the Old Testament, God told the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, to go out and tell the world about the kingdom of God, and they simply wouldn't do it. Jonah is the best example of that one because he had to take a submarine ride before he would go and do <laughs> what God wanted about spreading the word and news of the kingdom. Oh, by the way, the submarine was a big fish, not a whale. The Gospels tell the earthly story of Jesus. Jesus was not created some 2,010 years ago. I didn't do my math today, so I don't have it exactly. <laughs> I say that because our calendars are off. It was not simply 2,024 years ago, probably 2,026, 8, 28 or 30 years now uh, like since that. Jesus was born. But that's a calendar issue. I'm not going there. But it's, the Gospels tell about the life of Jesus on earth. He has been involved with the world since it began, mm -hmm. literally in creation. Nothing has ever been created without Jesus being involved, and nothing will be created uh, because while scientists have been able to clone a sheep, and I don't know what else now they might have been able to get away with, you know, they had to use things that were already in existence. God created everything out of nothing. And there's a big difference from that. Um, yep. Ex nihilo. The New Testament, God makes the new covenant with his people. Through believing in his son, Jesus, God invites everyone to become one of his children, including you and me and everybody else. It's something that we have to do on our own. In my case, I was 13 years old when I accepted Jesus as my Savior. But I was 26 years old before I really accepted him as my Lord. And I surrendered and became a chaplain starting that night. And that journey has taken me far and wide, to say the least. Now, what about the writings themselves? The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Although I think it's part of Daniel is written yeah. in Aramaic. Yep. Uh, and the New Testament is primarily written in Greek, not Hebrew. Mm -hmm. It was turned after that. It was translated into Latin. I skipped over, though. The Gospel of Matthew was yeah. written in Aramaic first. And then it was translated into Greek and Latin and all the way forward to 1500s when King James put uh, his church leaders in into gear to write a, a, an English version. But that was not even the first translation of the non-Latin Bible. Um, no. Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King Jr., but Martin Luther, uh, wrote and translated one of the first whole Bible translations. Uh, and that was in the 1200s. See, these things all come down over and over and over again. And people are always worried about the accuracy of these books of the Bible because they were all originally copied by hand. And they were allowed to have a certain number of small mistakes mm -hmm. before they had to start the page over. So it was always a concern as to how accurate these were. As I told said, the King James was written and published in 1511. Uh, the century before that, 
there was another Bible that was written out and it was printed, and it was called the Naughty Bible because there was <laughs> one word that was left out of the Ten Commandments. Sorry, folks, but it was. And it was published. And mind you, they went to great lengths to get this published and great cost back then. And the one word was, it said, thou shall commit adultery instead of thou shall not commit adultery. And so once they saw that, they had to pull all those Bibles back and destroy them because of the one word error. And we have found, thanks to the Dead Sea Scrolls, that the writings, that a group of, sorry, the, can you talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls, Bill? Yeah, sure. Well, you get I your mouth you fixed. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, uh, of course, the uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, originally discovered back in the 1940s by a shepherd boy, um, <clears throat> go back um, to, uh, oh shoot, uh, to the BCs and uh, roughly um, 200. advanced, yeah, roughly 200, um, advanced our knowledge of the Old Testament by about 500 years, um, and uh, um, because uh, that's how long it had been since, uh, how long it was between the Dead Sea Scrolls being written and when we had an existing copy of, uh, of the Old Testament. Um, but uh, um, they were written most likely by a group of people called the Essenes, um, who were uh, an aesthetic uh, uh, cast of, uh, of religious people. Uh, they were Jewish. Um, they had separated themselves off uh, primarily from uh, the rest of Israel to um, keep uh, themselves pure from Greek influence was the uh, was the big thing. But uh, um, they are ninety nine. They are more pure as far as uh, as far as going toward uh, um, toward their mistakes than Dove Soap is pure, and that I think is ninety nine point nine nine percent. Uh, <laughs> yes. The the uh, the Old Testament we have today is so uh, is so close to uh, um, to what the Essenes wrote that there might not there might just as well not be any uh, any differences at all. Um, so right. uh, um, so definitely so the uh, translators those handwritten translations were doing yep. an excellent job. Yes, with the exception well, of was... the Naughty Bible, perhaps. With the exception of the novel. That doesn't mean, and we'll get into <laughs> translations in a moment or two, but still it shows that we have this inspired word of God in these 66 books of the Bible. And it tells us how God has been working with us and how we have been trying and failing to work with him and then definitely yeah. trying and faithfully following him. Not that we're perfect, just forgiven, as the saying goes. Yep. There is we a are, 400 We are saints year... who sin. We are saints yep. who sin. <laughs> there you go. The Old Testament and the New Testament are separated by about 400 years. Uh, one of the stated... Uh, I consider goofs in the Bible, as I say, God did not speak to us for 400 years between the Old and the New Testament. That is not accurate. It is very important to understand that he did not talk to the nation of Israel as a whole during that time. And I can prove that biblically because in the Christmas narrative about the birth of Jesus. When we go to see Jesus uh, brought before the temple when he's about 45 days old, there are two people there, Simeon and Anna. And both of them individually go and, and tell, tell the story that God had spoken to Simeon in particular that he would not see death before he saw the Messiah, and he got to see it. Yes, God spoke to people during that 400 years, 
but he did not speak to the nation. And that I really feel that's important because God still speaks yeah. to us today. And it is important for us to listen and to give him time to listen, to speak to us today. And we have to see what it is that he wants us to be doing in the meantime. But that 400 years of, of silence is really a reference to speaking to the nation. Yeah. The and you Old have Testament to remember, prophets and stuff. you have to remember by looking at the history, you can see God's handiwork in what happened during those 400 years, for sure. Um, mm. You know, certain things had to happen for every for the path to be laid for Jesus to come and do his job as the Messiah. Um, and, the Greeks and needed to, get to the conquer story and, out. <laughs> yes, um, the Greek the Greeks had to conquer uh, and and build up their kingdom under Alexander the Great, um, and uh, and basically force everybody to learn Greek. Um, so that uh, when the Romans came along, Greek was the lingua franca of the uh, of the known world, and uh, um, and then the Romans conquered their empire and brought about the Pax Romana, which was uh, the the peace of Rome, um, basically peace at the at the tip of a spear. But uh, um, because of uh, because of those two things right there, you had everybody understanding one language. And you had the ability to move from place to place without having to worry about getting uh, getting shot with an arrow because somebody was at war because nobody was at war. And then uh, and then of course uh, um, specific things happening in the uh, in the Holy Land, um, you know, brought about uh, um, different groups of people um, that would uh, um, that would eventually lead to uh, lead to Jesus and the. Uh, um, and the the original disciples and apostles, and uh, um, and then from there the word was able to be spread easily throughout the uh, throughout the empire, and uh, um, in just a couple hundred years, massive change happened, and uh, um, and the rest, as they say, is history. Yep. Okay, you're absolutely right. And if if Alexander had made everybody learn Greek. Uh, yep. happily I've learned Greek and happily I've really forgotten it, but, uh, <laughs> if it hadn't been, that I way, still have been the story of Jesus would have been just this small little Jewish writing, Hebrew writing. Mm -hmm. Uh, and believe me, it, it makes Greek very easy to read comparatively. They even mm -hmm. do it from left, right to left instead of left to right. You know, speaking of that. Jews and Gentiles, you may, someone out there may not understand what that's all about. Originally, when it came out, Jew meant, as based from the Hebrew word Yehudai or Yehudi, and it means coming from Judah. Yep. And that's what the Jew, the word Jew means from that. It is no longer an acceptable reference point. We do not try to call anybody a Jew. And there's a good reason for that. There are more Jewish people in New York than there are in Israel. So, you know, it's like they've never been there. And I can't blame them for not wanting to be over there all the time, especially with all the terrible tragedies that are going on again in that part of the world. But that's what the term Jew refers to. Gentile refers to everyone else who doesn't come from Judea. So that's you and me for the most part, unless there's someone in the audience who happens to be a descendant from Judah. And I mean a recordable, uh, distance from there because we all go back to the time of Noah. We're all yep. related together through him. And this for three cents. So we have that. But it's good to know what the difference is. It was not meant as a derogatory term then. It is pretty much considered a derogatory 
term now. I highly recommend that you don't try to use it as a reference point. Point. Now let's get into which Bible chaplain. Uh, <laughs> first of all, let me say there was a huge, great effort called the King James Version of the Bible. I do not recommend it for people today, not unless they are really devout believers and able to get into all the these and thous of the old of the by of the King James version. I would also have any of those who say, well, that's what we have to read from. I would challenge them to read the introduction to the original King James Bible. Yeah. In it, the scholars who were brought together literally declare that the King James version that they were writing was for their generation. And they further go on to say, and every generation should update the Bible to meet their own levels of understanding. And that's the way I'll, I'll reference it. You find a Bible that you will read and keep reading, that's the translation you want. Right. Uh, there are always exceptions. Uh, now, now, there are there reasons... Are just, there are reasons to read the King James Bible. Um, they used, one of them is that they used different uh, source documents than most of the other Bibles use. Um, but one of the, that's also one of the, uh, one of the things that people put down about the uh, King James is that those source documents were more recent than the source documents that most other translations use to uh to to make their translations from um so uh um so there are differences between those source documents and uh um and so you get slightly different uh slightly different reads on some uh on some things um on but uh, also because the language is i mean you think about it at, at to your point if you uh if you think about it if you can't carry on a conversation in King James English, you probably shouldn't be relying on that to tell you how to act as a Christian. Uh, it'll trip you up. That's all there is to it. It'll trip you up. I mean, you, you think about it, um, you know, it would be hard enough to communicate with somebody from the United in the you know, someone from the United States today to go back a hundred years and try to have a conversation with somebody in the United States then, um, you know, let alone going back, what is it? Five, 600 years now, 500 years. Yeah. 500 years now. So seven, do I hear? <laughs> 700 1511? years. No, it's yeah. 2024. So 1511 not to 2024 22, would be, uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Not 500 years. <laughs> yeah, five hundred and five hundred and eleven years. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard enough but, having a conversation with the previous generation, and you have to look at which modern translations you appreciate and which ones you don't. Uh, the Living Bible. I'm not going into one story that is absolutely hilarious, but I will say that one of the Living Bible translations referenced in the New Testament, the greatest apostle, I believe, of all time. Barnabas is his real is his name, but they referred to him as Barney. <laughs> and all I can do is think of that silly purple dragon. Uh and and you know that's Barney or Barney Barney Fife from the Andy Griffith show who I fully loved as a comedian, but still to call Barnabas Barney, it took away from the effect of being able to read further in that translation. So I stopped doing that translation. There are some others that I find that aren't, and I'm going to flat out say it because it's true. One of the original Mormon translations of the Bible, that's the Church of Latter-day Saints, references to Jesus by saying, 
Jesus was a way, a truth, and a life, not the way. And also in John 3, that's John 14, 6. And then in John 3, 16, uh, they do not say God sent his only begotten son. Now, they have since gone back to the more King James points, and it says the way. But that's the way of it. They try to mislead from different directions, but that in particular because the teachings of Joseph Smith, the original founder of Mormonism, tried to mislead people. That's all. That's as simple as it, as it can be. Uh, the, to, uh, to the take Jehovah's them away Witness, from Jesus. Uh... And, and wait, I'm not quite ready for J, JWs okay. yet. Uh, okay. <laughs> and his, Joseph Smith's followers, after he was killed, uh, after he was killed, uh, they tried to say that Joseph Smith's words took priority over the teachings of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that is just absolutely wrong. Now, Bill, you can take it away on JWs. <laughs> Well, I was just going to keep it simple. The uh, um, the Jehovah's Witnesses also have their own translation of the Bible, which uh, twists a lot of things around, leaves a lot of stuff out, uh, which makes it really difficult to uh, to have an, a, 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 pr a productive discussion with a Jehovah's Witness about the Bible because they're using a distinctly different translation because it's not simply a translation. It's it's taken stuff and changed it according to the beliefs they want to hold. So they've definitely gone about and, and tickled the ears of their, uh, of their followers to, yeah. uh, to refer back to a biblical phrase. True enough. I wonder two more points about which Bible is right for you. If you don't already have Bible app on your phone, you should get one. They're free. That's not a problem. And they will give you multiple translations so that no matter what translation you are currently reading in, if you have trouble with, you can check other translations right there and get it. Now, I'd also like to let you know that any Bible that you read is good. I am currently, my wife and I currently, and have for the last, I don't know how many years, we've been married 52, but I know we haven't been reading it together all those years. Uh, we use a chronological timeline Bible because it is easy in the Old Testament to get lost. You can be reading about one thing and then all of a sudden it jumps to another and then it jumps back to something before that. And mm -hmm. so I really encourage a chronological Bible. It does get difficult. We have one that we're actually using right now. And the compilers of this chronological Bible, a verse in one <laughs> of one book, jump to another book and give another identical in, in time, the same thing or how they all follow together. In the last night or two, uh, Eileen and I have found uh, one page where it was 14 different places in the Bible to tell the continual story dealing with the tribes of Israel and the uh, their allowance of land in the, under the new covenant of the earth, and also all with their falling short of those hmm. agreements with God, how they did, followed God and how they didn't follow God. And when you're going back and forth that often, it's very distracting. So we've had to try to adjust that as well. But what about that, Chaplain? What are some tips for reading the Bible you choose? Bill, you want to start off with any of that? Well, um, one thing I would keep in mind is that much like 
the uh, the four gospel writers, the translators of each ver of each uh, version of the Bible have a different intention in mind, or might have a different intention in mind. Um, yeah. You know, some uh, some Bibles are looking for a literal word for word translation, um, and others are looking for a meaning translate. You know, tr to translate the meaning of, of phrases and sentences um, to try to give mm -hmm. a better idea of what the original author might have meant, um, and others are somewhere in between those two. Um, you know, and also uh, um, to remember that they are translations and there are words that don't translate. Um, one, one, uh, one good example is gopher wood. Gopher is just the transliteration of the Hebrew word. We don't know what gopher wood was. We, we don't know what it is. Um, it, it could be a wood that doesn't Talking exist about anymore. The story of Noah folks. Yes. The building of the ark. <laughs> and uh, um, and so we just say go for wood because it's easier that way. Um, and uh, and some words just don't translate well at all. And some some words could have multiple meanings. One that we went over uh, um, earlier uh, uh, or yeah uh, earlier in the week um, with uh, with Matthew uh, three talking about John the Baptist that uh, John the Baptist would. Uh, um, would baptize with water. Well, it turns out that the Greek word that's translated in in the Amplified as with could also mean in or by or you know something like that. And they just chose to go with with because it was easier. Um, and uh, um, and there are plenty of words out there like that. And you know, Greek uh, for for one thing is kind of a contextual language. You can put different words together. You can put the same words together in different ways and get completely different sentences, um, which is why I'm a little scared of having to learn Greek. <laughs> but uh, um, but I'm probably going to have to learn a little bit of it at least. So uh, um, you know, so so bear bear those things in mind. Um, you know, there is a reason why the uh, why the Muslims say that you have to read the Quran in Arabic because that's the original language it was written in. And to try to read it in another language would be another person's interpretation. And it's somewhat similar with the Bible, although we trust our translators to be honest and, uh, and forthright and good at what they do. Um, and, uh, and many of them are quite good, but you know, they have disagreements about what particular words and phrases uh, mean and how they should be translated. So, uh, um, so, you know, bear that in mind. So some, sometimes you may want to have multiple translations sitting around um, so that, you know, you, you read your, yeah, or on your app, um, you know, you're reading your NIV and, uh, um, and, you know, you may, you may say, wow, that makes a lot of sense. Or I don't understand that. Let's go to uh, let's go to a different version. Let's go to the uh, the ESV or uh, um, or uh, or something else, you know, or the Amplified, you know, and see what it says there. And let's see what it says at another one. And I've done that before um, with the especially with the uh, the Bible study, um, taking a look at multiple versions of the uh, of the Bible to uh, to get a better idea, try to get a better idea of its meaning. Of the and, same passage, so, yeah. yes. All yes. right, so tips for reading your Bible. You might want to start with prayer. Yes. Ask God to help guide you and the Spirit to help you understand the passages that are before you. You can start anywhere in the Bible that you want, but you might get very bored and tired if you start with the Old Testament and Genesis 1-1. Now, some of that is very exciting to start with, but it will get into other portions of it that just sort of drag, especially when they get into the who was the father of whom and the father of <laughs> the genealogies. They can be very difficult. Mm -hmm. But you need to start at the beginning of any particular book you want. Don't start in the middle. Don't just go for your fun favorite passages. But start at chapter 1, verse 1, 
and read through until you get done with that particular book. And don't try to overstuff it. You have to allow time for Bible study. You have to allow time for God to speak to you. And you need time to think about what you've just read. I don't know about you, but back in school, I could do that really well with reading stuff fast. And I'd retain it for five minutes, long enough for a test, maybe. And then I'd forget everything about it. I have been reading the Bible through now for, oh, heavens. I know it's more than 40 years that I've been reading from Genesis through Revelation. I certainly was reading a lot of it before that, but not systematically. But I still find new things or relevant things that I either was not aware of before, or I had been aware of them and I had forgotten them. And I hate to admit that last part, but I believe it's true uh, that I have read things and forgotten certain things and have to relearn them because there's so much wealth in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Now, for those of you who really don't have a history on reading the Bible, I recommend the Gospel of Mark first. It's the shortest. I admit that. It does not have the Christmas story in it. Uh, Matthew and Luke do, but not John and Mark. But Mark is the easiest, shortest book for the first knowledge. After that, I would recommend that you read the Acts of the Apostles. However, if you are having <laughs> personal issues in life, you should read the letter of James. It is much shorter than Mark, but it gives some advice for day-to-day -day living no matter what. For the more mature Christians in reading the Bible, I recommend the Gospel of John, because the Gospel of John is the best one to see little snippet stories about the disciples. And those snippet stories, little stories about them, is important to us because we are the current disciples. If we are learning about Jesus, we want to see how they reacted on things. And it really is important to see that. That's the Gospel of John. But I love all four of the Gospels, without a doubt. And you can certainly get what you call a, uh, no, I can't, I forgot the name. What is it, Bill, when they have all four of them listed side, column by column? Synoptic? No, not synoptic. Uh, no, that is the that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But there is a Bible that all has them. all four of the Gospels right next to each other. I just have synopsis of the four Gospels. Synopsis of the four? That'll work. Yeah. That'll do. Come on back this way. Yeah. So the synopsis of the four Gospels, that way you can see how they relate to each other. It is believed that Mark was the first Gospel written, but there is sort of a historical belief that there was one manuscript before Mark's, and it was referred to as Q. Yep. You won't find Q anywhere uh, you. unless you're a Star Trek fan and you can go watch Q on some <laughs> of the... Uh, Next generation. Uh, <laughs> next generation episodes. Yes, there you go. Uh, yeah. It's um, really... <laughs> Sorry, I yeah. don't want to have that joke as our way of ending, but it's no, now no. five minutes till Bill. Yep. Um, I did want to I did want to say, if you are not yet a Christian or a new Christian, like, I mean, brand new, newly printed, the ink's still wet, kind of uh, kind of Christian, you may want to start with Romans. Um, because Romans, um, it, it's, the, it's often referred to as the Romans road, but, um, but it can take the, the book of Romans can take you through the process of becoming a Christian and, uh, um, and, 
you know, gaining your salvation. Um, and uh, so, uh, so that can be a, a good one for, or, or if you're looking to reach out to non-Christians, that's a good one to, uh, to get into. Um, because uh, the Romans Road will help prepare you for how to help people become Christians. So that was just something I wanted to add good. in there. So yes, then that's a good... we uh, we have come to yet uh, the end of yet another episode of uh, YWL Online. Um, Want to thank you all for uh, for being here with us. And if you've come this far, perhaps you will come a little further with us and join us in this family we call Christianity. We don't do this through mystical spells or magical ceremonies. Um, we uh, we just uh, um, you just have a change of heart and uh, um, and accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior in your heart. And you speak those words as an overflow of your belief. And uh, um, we have some words that we use to help guide people with that. Uh, the sinner's prayer is, is not a magical spell. Um, it will not magically transport you to heaven when you die. Um, you can't, uh, you can't, it's not a magic ticket. It's not the golden ticket. Uh, no Willy Wonka here. Um, but, uh, um, but uh, it, uh, it should be spoken as, like I said, an overflow of the belief of your heart. And so if you believe in your heart and speak with your, and speak with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, then you will be saved. So uh, I invite you uh, that if you do believe in your heart that, uh, um, that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, then, uh, um, then I invite you to say these words uh, with us. So, uh, um, so here we go. Dear Lord, I am a sinner. Here. Cleanse me of my wickedness. Uh, guide my steps along the path you would have me take in this life. Help me to do the work you would have me do for the building of your kingdom. Come into my heart and be the Lord and Savior of my life. All these things we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And there you have Amen. it. So, uh, we put right. this out on Saturday, which makes it really easy to figure out the next steps. Um, you might be watching this at a different part of the week, but don't worry. There's always going to be people at, at a church local to you, most likely. Um, although uh, I'm pretty sure there's a couple churches around here that are closed at least a couple days out of the week. <laughs> We're in a town of 4,000, so that happens. Um, but, uh, um, but yeah, go out and find yourself a Bible-believing church with a Bible-preaching pastor and faithful, uh, faithful congregants to uh, to help guide you along your next steps. Um, if you haven't been to church in a while, it's time to get back because uh, God's got a use for you, and uh, um, and it's up to you to uh, to decide to be a part of His plan because He doesn't need us, but we certainly need Him. And uh, so, uh, so Amen. go out and find yourself one of those churches. And uh, get to work, and then come back here for another episode of YWL Online. Because uh, <laughs> we're back, we're back, baby. So, uh, um, <laughs> so yeah, so uh, new episodes on Tuesdays and Saturdays. Uh, on Tuesdays is our deep dive Bible study, where we look at language and history and culture and all of those good things to uh, to get a better idea of what uh, what the Bible can mean. Uh, what it mean? What it meant to the person, people who the person, people who wrote it, to the people who first read it, and what it can mean to you too. And uh, then, of course, on Saturdays is uh, anything can happen. Saturday, where we try to bring biblical principles into the modern world uh, through anything can happen. Saturday, and uh, right now we're doing that uh, with the help of Catherine Slattery's uh, book, Dear God, I Have a Question. And uh, hopefully we've uh, been able to answer uh, some of yours. Uh, feel free to reach out and uh, um, you know let us know uh, what uh, what you think, uh, what's on your heart. Um, if you have uh, have some prayer concerns, uh, needs, uh, we'd be happy to pray for you. And uh, um, that's about it. Uh, do you find gentlemen have anything else to say to the nice people? I love you all. Praise the Lord. No waka waka waka. Waka waka waka. That's better. <laughs> and God's blessing for this day and all the days of our future. Amen to that. 
And uh, be safe out there. Remember to wash your hands and stay tuned for the ending credits. Thank you all for tuning in. This has been a presentation of Bald Spots Productions. I'd like to thank our producer, my beloved mother, Eileen Hatch. I, of course, am your humble host. I would also like to thank my co-host and mentor, my beloved father, the happy chap, Chaplain Bill Hatch. I'm similarly thankful for my Ed McMahon, Rudy Corlew. Yes! Support the show if you feel so led over on Patreon.com. We're known as Bald Spots Pro. Don't you dare miss Not Quite After Midnight. You can find us on Facebook, YouTube, and wherever fine podcasts are offered. Be sure to like, comment, and share. You know, subscribe, follow, whatever it is you've got to do to kick that algorithm into gear and help us reach more people. If you or someone you know needs support now, call or text 988 or chat 988lifeline.org. That is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline here in the United States. 